Good day, good evening, good night, good morning, and welcome to another exciting episode of Black Cauldron. Unfortunately, I am not drinking. I need to fix this, ladies. I need to make sure this like because I'm always doing something beforehand. I need to make sure I'm doing something drinking to draw. This is a this is a salon. This is a you know, this is adults. Kids are not necessarily uninvited, but you know, this is for big this is for adults. So we should be, you know, acting adultish. Wow. And I promise this time I promise I would refrain from swearing. Deb is a church lady. And you know, Janina is not a potty mouth as she is oh. on the Real Tennis Podcast. It's, I'm I trying so hard. I want I you to know this is power. hard. This is hard for me. But if you ladies are doing the effort, I need to be a good host, co-host, and make that effort. So before I go any further, let me introduce my co-hostesses with the most sisters. I am nothing without these ladies. We have Debs at Shackle 52. How are you, ma'am? Hello, how's everybody? She's our guiding principal here, okay? So if we sound really smart and, you know, we sound really cool, <laughs> it's, it's Deb. <laughs> it's Deb. <laughs> if Janina and I sound really smart or cool, <clears throat> Deb always sound really smart. And she cool. really does, doesn't she? <laughs> so it, it's just, think of it like, you know, like we, we are soaking up osmosis. So Deb is the, Deb is the, the, the center of this whole uh, podcast here. And we have Janina. How are you, Janina? I'm good. I'm having, you know, tea because. Good to go. I mean, it just seems appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've already drank. I drank one cup today, but you know, I don't want to make another just yet. I have to clean my kitchen first, and I don't have magical powers to do all of that. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, it's real here with you. And we uh, we finally left the first book. I hope you enjoyed the first two series, the first two episodes. And we welcome comments and criticism, um, constructive criticism, that is. Um, if you'd like anything fun you'd like us to do, you know, how we can improve, what you enjoy, because we're all here to open it. And we're not doing this. We have talks amongst ourselves about the book. So we really didn't, you know, so we don't need, we're not doing this for us. We're doing this mainly to... Oh, I, stop it. We are totally <laughs> doing this for us because and we are no, all no, no, Harry no, no, Potter no. junkies. <laughs> no, I mean that. No, I mean the fact that we're actually having a podcast because we have conversations by ourselves and we're it's stimulating just the same. We don't need yeah. to actually record and put it out there. So we're putting this out there as an effort to share. This is a sharing experience why we're doing this. So, um, and you should know that half of the things that we usually say in our conversations we talk about things that brand new <laughs> on the podcast, so we don't literally, so we're not having the podcast over and over again, but it's really fun, and it's so, it's one of the best things um, I'm doing. It's equal to my other podcast, just saying. Aww. Um, Aww. That's because you have, let me say something, people, you should never go wrong <laughs> when you hang with black ladies. You never go wrong. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Black woman, believe them. What they say, you better do it, okay? <laughs> and, and I mean, this is like, you know, a true personification of black girl power here. I'm telling you, Absolutely. black girl, black girl this magic. Is, this is black girl real magic here. <laughs> hey. So we are on to the second book, which um, for all of the, um, I think, in publication terms, this, from the second book to the seventh book, they kept they all have the same names. I think the first book was the only one where in some places it's a Philosopher's Stone or the Sorcerer's Stone. And from now on, all of the books kept the same name. So the second book, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. And I want to say that I wasn't, this was the book, though this wasn't the book that really got me hooked, I would say. This was the book where I was like, okay, things are definitely getting interesting, and I would keep reading to the third book. I would, I would continue. So this book sort of, sort of the first book was like, hmm, this was neatly wrapped up. Um, okay, nothing unusual, and I'm saying there's nothing necessarily crazily unusual because um, I find that these books are in the folklore of Enid Blyton and somewhat so. 
British magical lore sort of have a lot of these elements. But the second book was where I was like, oh, something magical and something completely, 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 completely different is really, really happening here. And I really want to continue going. And by the time I get to the fourth book, I was like, okay, um, girl, I'm going to stand outside. I'm going to try to find the other books. Wait, I, I cannot wait. I need these books to be out every other week as soon as I finish. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God, there's only three more books. Like, this is crazy. This is trash. Like, I need I need every bit of detail that is happening in this world. I need to know how everything works. So the second book was really, and looking back, um, the second book seemed to be, um, Deb pointed out to us that the second book is a pivotal, pivotal book. Um, it is the book that basically reveals everything, you know, so, the ladies, could you let us know what did you think of the second book as you reread it? Because we all reread the book as we uh, <laughs> do the podcast, just so you know. <laughs> so well, this, go ahead, Deb. Oh, okay. I, I just, it's really, I will confess that when I read this book the first time, I just thought it was a nice adventure story. Mm-hmm. Of course, because we don't know all of the what the various meanings of so many of the of the things that happen in the in the book we don't know the significance of those things so i just enjoyed it as a straightforward adventure story and because um it does wrap up no cliffhanger um even though we know that there are more to come um i just thought it was nicely done and i was really focused on what happened the plot and i thought it was well plotted there was enough um, misdirection so that you didn't immediately solve the mysteries. And um, so th- I, it was very enjoyable. When we get further into the series and probably actually at the end, you really, when you go back and reread this book, you think, oh my goodness, every possible element that we need for the series is somewhere dropped in this book. Mm-hmm. And or most or many of them are dropped mm-hmm. in this book. So then I began to really appreciate um, how important it is to the rest of the series. So for me, Chamber of Secrets is my least favorite of the series. Um, I have read it a million times, what feels like, and I have never truly appreciated it until this podcast until Deb pointed out. And even though I knew because I've read it so much, I didn't look for things um, until this rereading. I just, like you said, I, I just appreciated it for a nice story. Um, lots of things happened, but you really on first read have no idea of the information that you're being presented with. It just seems like you're getting bombarded with all of this stuff from the magical world that doesn't necessarily mean anything for anything down the uh, road. So I was just like, yeah, okay. It's an, it's okay. I didn't love it. I still don't love it. Um, but I absolutely 100% appreciate it on a level that I never even considered before. And I can't wait to dive into that. So, um, I would say that there are, I have so many things reveal themselves to me in this book now that I'm looking back now at this point. Um, and I like that, Deb, you said, you know, like a nice adventure story, because that's kind of like what I thought of the first book. And this is a nice adventure story. And when I got to the second book, I was like, this is still an adventure story, but I'm not so sure if this is nice in the sense that. <laughs> The, we are having that nice things are happening because one of the things that I'm looking back now as I'm rereading this book is the level of violence or attempted violent acts that are happening mm-hmm. and we are somehow being led to think we're talking about marshmallows that it feels like it's very light but when you consider the, the, the sort of things that are actually happening it's like um, this is this is wicked. This is dangerous. <laughs> this is uh, bullying comes up again, and it's a pivotal plot point here. And I'm just like, ooh, these books are the darkness that I think that I attributed 
this happened that I found <clears throat> slowly build up to a crescendo till the fifth book. What I'm realizing is that the darkness was always there from the very beginning, like we said. It the really is, is, isn't it? The, it really is. the book opens talking about an attempt to triple homicide, and it's like, like, and the mm. real target was a baby. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not the two, it's not the two people that, that you would have expected him wanting to eliminate these two prodigious and you know skilled wizards and which that wasn't. His attempt wasn't to, wasn't them. We realized it's actually hinted at Olyan. It's him. It's the baby that was the real target. That you know that the um, Voldemort says in the first book. I didn't have to kill her. You know, I told her to move, and that seemed to be a point that he seems to be stressing as if that's a thing. Like I told her to move. Like what's she supposed to do? Oh yeah, kill my baby. Let me walk out of here and be normal. <laughs> like. Bro, right. like, my God, this. so that darkness and that, you know, like, um, heaviness within the books from the beginning. So, um, we decided we don't, I, we, again, we're assuming that everyone has read the book. Um, if the, the title isn't clear to people, oh, Harry goes back to school, the a chamber of secrets, a, a chamber that's filled with secrets, and it's also called the chamber of secrets has been opened up in the school and there is chaos and mayhem, you know, and Harry gets into the Chamber of Secrets as always. He gets into places that he has no business being in. <laughs> uh, he has penetrated. I, I don't, I think at the end there will be no secret that this child has not um, found at this school. You know, sometimes my mother used to say, when you go looking for trouble, you certainly will find it. <laughs> you know, right. in this case, <laughs> Harry. You know, Harry, not only go looking for trouble, trouble just seems to arrive at his doorstep. So, and the, whatever is in the Chamber of Secret is vanquished, and Harry is safe and sound in the end. You know, happy ending. Um, so, as always, I know one of the things that I find fascinating about the, the book is the, when Harry is at Privet Drive. Because mm -hmm. I think in... <clears throat> I think when people talk about the books and the series often, they just describe Harry being put upon that the, the, the abuse that Harry deals with, it's like a fairy tale Cinderella type of abuse. But I think Rowan is painstakingly telling us that it Harry is, is so he is incredibly suffering. bad. It is so bad. Especially, like, I mean, it happens in book one and we see, you know, that he's being treated like a piece of shit, right? We see that. But in the beginning of this book, oh, my word. I, I think that the Dursleys have actually regressed simply because you know, people can say, oh, um, now they are, they're fearful of Harry. You know, in a way, because they never know. They don't know what that magic means, the fact that he is a wizard. But they have just given full vein to um, or full reign to their dis dislike of him, the fact that they don't want him around, um, the abuse of him. But they're reined in a little bit because they don't know when the wizarding world might come down on them. Mm -hmm. So but it's really um, it's just it's just very, very strongly abusive and physically abusive, in addition to being isolating and all the other things that it was in the first book. I mean, can we just, like, remember that this is a 12-year-old child, right? A 12-year-old. Exactly. And you're telling him constantly that he doesn't matter. Go to your room and pretend to be invisible. Pretend he says this over and over. I'm going to go to my room and pretend like I don't exist. You cannot do that to a child. Like that gets embedded into their DNA. psyche. Mm -hmm. Like it's, yeah. you cannot, but you know, so there's, there's that aspect of mental abuse and belittling and what that must do to your own self-esteem, which we know that it's everlasting. I mean, I don't think that ever truly goes away throughout the entire series. Um, but 
This is the book that Reels mentioned, you know, Aunt Petunia throws a damn frying pan at his head. Like, come <laughs> on. Like, it is crazy. Hold on. I want to, because when she does this, it is so casually that she's doing it. As if this were a normal thing. This Not is like, written, oh. it's written like going, oh, and by the way, it's Tuesday morning, throws frying pan and, and at Harry's head. head. <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and what is even more I think it's that they that they're not just they just don't dislike Harry. What is clear every single time is that they're deliberately cruel. That yeah, they yeah. that they, yes. they this is not like, oh, so you're here, whatever. This is like, oh, you're here, guess what? You're nasty, your parents are worthless, and guess what? Nobody likes you, no one loves yeah. you. So guy. These people mm-hmm. sent this child. They went through the effort to send him a Christmas present every bloody Christmas at Hogwarts, and it was trash. Yeah, they sent right. him a toothpick this time around. A bloody <laughs> toothpick. And I'm just God. like, and I mean, I am aware of what happens in the world well enough to know that this is not a fairy tale. People do this to children. Yes. Yeah. That there is, I am sure that there are files where there are actually documented cases of child abuse mm-hmm. that is written where people do this sort of thing. People with Dudley coming, and what is even more crazier to me is that they have now um, co opted Dudley. So right. Dudley is right. now corrupted. Like there is just nothing that Dudley doesn't recognize. Here is a fellow child like myself. And he's being abused. And Dudley's manner of abusing Harry is just beyond physical. Because it's very clear that Sue, like for a long time, he can't physically get at Harry. Harry's too fast. He's too slender. Mm-hmm. You know, he can't physically get him. But Dudley knows I can torture this kid psychologically. Yeah, yes, he says. Harry, you don't have it. It's your birthday. I know it's your birthday. I'm Petunia and I'm going to burn. I don't even acknowledge it's his birthday. No, not right? at all. But he's just like, I know what day it is. And guess what? No one likes you. None of your, none of those friends at your school want you. They sent you nothing. No cakes. Nothing. Like, and, and we know that we, because we, I think we saw his birthday the year before. We know right. his birthday is a complete show, right? That they're buying all this present and it's a whole yeah. production for no reason, right? It's over the top because, you know, they are wasting money, you know, like, let's give you another present that he doesn't care anything about. And all of this is just an effort to show Harry that he's the oh, worthless. I'm just like, this is insane. I felt genuinely sad when Harry's, like, singing happy birthday to himself. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's horrible. That is so horrible. And it also indicates that, um, that, Dudley has that they're paying that kind of attention to with the things that hurt Harry, like not getting any correspondence from his friends. So there, it's not like just accidental. They're mm-hmm. observing. They're wanting mm-hmm. looking yeah. for opportunities where they can taunt him, where they can, um, you know, make him feel bad about himself. So this is not this is not accidental. This is not accidental cruelty. This is deliberate, premeditated cruelty. Maybe. Yeah, Just mean, nasty find. bastards. And because last last year, the year before, in book one, Harry never got, excuse me, Harry never got a letter, and they were all attempting to stop him from getting any letters. Right. Now they don't even have to board up the letter box. They just know, just like, nope, we're looking. Nothing comes right. for you, Harry Potter. You went to a and, school, and even the school doesn't like you. Yeah. And I'm just like, wow. And then when, you know, he gets, when when he, it's noticed that he's in the home, um, when Dobby pulls his little tricks, <laughs> it just, you know, it's like, you can't, the, these people, Mr. Dursley's business partners would never in a million years know if Harry went to school with Dudley or not. They would never know. But they say that he goes to the school for the severely irreparable behavioral right. kids, you know, like, I mean, just ev- at every corner and at every opportunity, they are just 
beating him down and beating him down and beating him down. And I just think that um, we don't always appreciate what that does to Harry and how that carries him forward into his life at Hogwarts. So there is a um, there is a health index. I think recently there's a school of study that they just did. Um, recently they they factor in. I forget what it's called. I'm I'm, I'm gonna say it's trauma index, but it may have an, a proper, a, a more specialized name, where they look at life expectancy and health outcome of people. And what they have realized is that, particularly in people of color, is that their life expectancy and healthcare outcome is actually lower than white people or just people in, um, in general. They mostly look at it in a race-based factor. Um, but the implication goes outward in the fact that they've realized that when you take the trauma index, index like who have had a parent shot in their home, who have seen homicide in their life, dealt with severe abuse, had like an ill parent and whatever, that typically that then starts to re-scramble the DNA and affect your tissues and your organs, basically. That typically, right. you tend to have a higher risk of getting high blood pressure. You tend to be in more violent situations lead to drugs, uh, you know, those kind of outcomes. And relatively, your life expectancy is short. And I am like, I am surprised Harry isn't in the dungeons making up some kind of potion, some kind of sleep draft. Right. Uh, to, because that has been, I mean, that happens to him, right? Where he has suffered so much trauma and they're like, no, you cannot function awake. We need to put you on that, basically. Mm-hmm. You need the strongest sleeping potion. You need to go to sleep. And I, I didn't want to mention it now, but I think it's important to us mention it now. I mean, the amount of trauma that is happening to so many people in this book and no one gets therapy just there is just no one's action and i, and I say therapy because you know i don't want to sound like you know like everything it should be done with therapy but no one deals with the problem like right. actually discuss this is what is happening to me right you know um all we hear of harry when he talks about his home life is just like all oh, those muggles were right cruel to him that's it that's it. No one talks about when they're cruel to a child. What does that mean? No one says. No one asks about what the trauma and the implication is to think. No one even. No one even asks each other about the trauma. Like I think Ron asked Harry once. Do you remember what happened when Voldemort attacked you? And Harry said, "I don't remember anything." And that's it. Mm-hmm. They never I never considered that. I no never considered never that. Asked, but, never it was, but I do think it I think it has impacted his personality. We we'll see I mean and I think that, you know, it, 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 you'll see that people respond in different ways. And in Harry's case, it has made him into and we talked about this a little bit with the last book, and then even more so with this book, it has made him a reactor. It makes him run towards danger. Um, it makes him um, just care, put more on his shoulders than should be there, you know, with being 12 years old. Um, even before he has the sense reels, and you talked about his sense of, pers- of, per- of purpose, even before he is fully aware of that, he is already a reactor and someone who is taking on more than his share. Um, like he has to save things. He has to fix things. Um, which we will talk about down the road, whether when that's not positive. But in this particular book, you know, he just completely runs towards danger um, whenever it presents itself. And do this, do this, it would come up. We see this already. What is also being set up here in these books, in these early books, every single time, is Harry's ability to take pain, psychological trauma, take it, internalize it, put it in a little box, and move on. Like, right. take, I mean, because, I mean, we'd see this, and, and, and it's not accidental, because it, it will become a thing mm-hmm. that it is yeah. a skill that 
it becomes a skill and an actual skill. Well, and, and we know this book that we talked about every nothing happens by accident. This entire book is one not accident. <laughs> like, right, right. So, oh my gosh, there's just so much. There's so, so much. So let's get into it. Let, let, so, well, we deal with the home. So. We deal with the home, except for this is when we meet the lovely little Dobby, the house elf. This is our, I think this, this is this our first introduction to a house elf in general, right? Yeah. In the entire series. So we get to, we get to meet Dobby and, um, you know, Dobby becomes such a beloved character through the series and, um, gosh, he's a mess, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Dobby. I don't know. Like, I and want to. Be- and also abuse. Dobby <laughs> is abused, right? What else? Of what? What I one isn't? Also, but I mean, abuse. that seems to go along with the territory. But right. it presents us with this whole other magical world because house elves have their own powers, and apparently, very very powerful magic um, right. that wizards don't have. So we get introduced to something here. We just get a little bit of a teaser, um, but he just, you know, he, he comes to pivot drive. He creates all of this chaos. Um, and then, you know, we, we know now that Dobby creates chaos wherever he goes, even if it's helpful in the end. It's still somehow chaotic, which really goes along with like how he looks. Even I love Dobby uh, personally. Mm-hmm. I could tell Reels does not. He's like, listen, this mm-hmm. little mofo. <laughs> Two things I want to say is, oh my god, I forget what one of them. Oh yes, my first gripe with the magical, and I'm gonna first for the first issue is the magical um, world, like elemental magic like how magic operates in the world i have a lot of questions and issues about that and this is my first problem here dobby does magic and the magic wizarding world can figure out when magic happens but not who magic does let me say there's no way you can convict me you cannot convict me if you can't tell when a house of does magic <laughs> as opposed to when right. a human does right. magic I don't want no letter from my, my father Hopcock. Like, girl, mm. take that piece of paper and shove that up somewhere where I don't See? even know. What it is. I just imagine that it it was based on the location of it. I never even considered that. I never did. I just take things at face value. I really do. Because here's the problem with that, because it, Harry doesn't exist in a place where only he can exist. Right? No, but I mean... But, at because, Pivot Drive, it would be Harry. More than likely, if someone was, if if there was a notification, ding, 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 at the Ministry of Magic, mm-hmm. that something, some kind of magical act was performed on Pivot Drive, of of course it would be Harry. Oh, but here's the thing. Uh, it, uh, it never uh, is. No, 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 throughout... no, 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 actually, he does magic. He does magic. A couple there. times, yeah. but... but... But I would say, for example, when you're driving in a car and they send you a speeding ticket uh, from one of the cameras, right? They don't attach it to your license because though it's your car, anyone can be in that car. So they assign right. the summons to the car. No, my okay. thing is that it's very clear that Anyone can pop up there because we've, we we see evidence of this mm-hmm. that other magical being can be there. In fact, the book opens with two magical being present. Right, right? and right. I'm just like, you're saying underage magical because my thing is just like wizards at home can do magic, right? Because when children at home, let's say Ron and Hermione are doing, not Hermione, but the Ron is doing magic at home, how can they say that it's an underage wizard that did the magic then? Right, because you live in a house with qualified wizards. So to me, it's just like... They probably wouldn't. They probably wouldn't um, be able to trace if Ron was practicing his magic. They probably couldn't. And I'm sure, you remember he said that there was a spell that in the first book that that one of the twins had taught him? Nobody is going to replicate, nobody's going to reprimand him for that. Because he gets to school. Yeah. There were but, so many wizards of age in that house. He would have taught it to him at home because he's doing it on the train. So they, they, they 
then they know that if you've got a house full of wizards who are of age, you really can't trace underage wizardry. You to, can. In a, house, in, that, in a house like that. Well, they would, no, they, they would accuse you because it's one of the things where when eventually in the seventh book, when Harry goes to the borough, he can't use magic until he becomes 17. Right. Because they're afraid the trace would be on him. And I'm like, I don't know how effective this trace is because the trace <laughs> Oh my God, you are so right. I hate it when you trace, do this. <laughs> the trace doesn't, because the, the magical presence, because the, without, the magical trace is supposed to work twofold, right? One, it's supposed to detect underage wizardry, which also is going to lead to another question about how magical education works, right? I can only do magic when I'm in school. What kind of nonsense is that? So, like, right. I mean, I don't want to jump like too, too far ahead. But, because, but other, wait, I have a question about that. Mm-hmm. Did something happen in book seven where they put a trace on Harry? Or was that strictly because he was underage? Well, remember, I, the trace is run by the Ministry of Magic, right? I know. And I think we're afraid that if you were to use magic... But your argument only works if that's what it is, and I can't remember. And I believe no, you, because you always catch these little things. No, like they that. were. I think I think though they didn't fully explain what it was, I think they were afraid that because of how the trace allegedly works, right? That right. they would be able to augment the principles and attach, get to him. Because that's why they weren't doing flu powder, right? Because it's connected to the ministry. And perhaps the ministry can control who is going through flu and be able to capture that person. That makes sure all flu is connected. You have to come to the ministry. Yeah, that's it's a, a network. It's a, it's network. a network. Yeah, they were afraid of how the network worked. But the trace works two ways. The trace supposedly detects underage magic and also detects when magic happens in front of a muggle. But my and specific I, question is, though, in book seven, when there's that trace on Harry, and they are afraid that he's going to use magic because then someone will know where he is. I, I right. remember that 100%. My question is, was there was there something that was put on Harry to trace specifically him or were they relying on the fact that he was still underage and it would have automatically come to him? That's what I'm not remembering clearly. No, there wasn't something magical that's on him. Apparently, there wasn't. They, don't, they don't explain how this magical okay. trace happened, but yeah. I think there was some reference about so we're just every, every wizard and witch is registered. Yeah, so we're just to assume right. that it was the underage thing then. Right, it, it, is, it is the underage thing that they were afraid So of how old age. is Dobby? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, Dobby doesn't work that but way, Dobby, right? So you think Dobby was relying on the fact that um, that he was in proximity to Harry, right? Yeah, and, for sure. And, and his proximity to Harry would confuse, and you know, because nobody's expecting a Dobby a to, be, to be there, right? A and clearly, it works. They, you know, they that they, they would just uh, assign <laughs> the magic that was done there to Harry. Um, just because of their proximity, just because of his proximity. Right. This in the whole Dobby showing up in this introduction to house elves also brings up the fact that we we did touch on this, and I'm sure that we'll continue to touch on it. Um, whether or not you need a wand to do magic, house elves don't no. have wands. No, no, no. Um, no. This they, they explain these principles that the other quote unquote magical creatures have magical powers. Not our ability to do magical things. But I feel they like house elves do magic. Right, they can do magic yeah. in one of the cases. Be there are rules that are bound by them, but they don't because in this magical world, for them, wand mag wand magic is an extension of the power. Right. Because this is this thing that I think the um the goblins have an issue. The goblin is just like we cannot extend our power. With the with, with wands, yeah, we need wands to extend our powers. But it's kind of odd because in most other magical worlds, like most of the magical fiction, it's wand magic is is limited. It's it's mm-hmm. it's a limiting factor. Like you need this piece of stick in order for the magic to right. work. And we also you, well, we we do find out that a house elf has the ability to use a wand. They just don't have their own wand. No, that no house elf never used a wand. A house elf just picked up a wand. 
Just yeah, he picked up someone. He picked never? up on someone. No, it they never, never confused. No. no, they can do oh, because he's, he's like caught holding it, but he's yeah, never used because it. he disarmed her. Because and and th- this is my problem with Dobby. So for me, immediately I read Dobby, and it's even worse hearing a version of the book being read. <laughs> Dobby is literally, uh, Dobby is literally supposed to represent black people are slaves. And if we go back to Grip Hook, not the, the the goblins, they're basically, in my mind, this is Jewish um, symbolism here. These are Jewish, the money people, the people who are counting money and they can't be trusted. These are like this kind of a um, caricature of certain people. Dobby's speech pattern, just how Bobby, that he had a Dobby is a slave, basically. And I'm like, JK, I'm not sure what you're doing here, but a lot of these magical creatures, because there is no reason, in, in my mind at least, but the goblins and elves can exist, right? But they can be, and they're clearly thinking beings, sentient beings, right? They can, they're capable of understanding what's happening in the world. There is no reason why they cannot be uh, a full member of the society. Because right. if you go back to, um, and that's part of the policy that is a big theme in the book about who gets to be, what is purity, what is right, what is what is right in terms of like a right magical being. Because it seems as if a quiet issue that is happening is that very clearly that the humans, wizards and witches, are quietly asserting that in the magical world, we are the thing. And mm-hmm. everybody else is a creature. Sure, which is, right. Which is right. Even though these people are operating and conversing with human beings, you know what I mean? Operating on equal level that Dobby isn't incapable of understanding what's happening in the world. But yet yeah. Dobby's speech pattern sounds like someone who can't read. He is, he's, he's in poor physical health. He's missing teeth. He's constantly uh, <laughs> drunk, <laughs> yeah, drinking, like the, the, the minorest thing. Oh, like, 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 I'm like, so the other <laughs> question I have, the other question that I have is like, why would you have a house slave, uh, a house elf, who can't wash well, clothes or uh, iron clothes? <laughs> because laundry is, is distinctly out of Dobby's repertoire, right? Because Dobby well, cannot be given well, clothes. Himself. Laundry for himself. But Dobby doesn't wash his clothes because his tunic is always dirty. The pillow. No, I'm saying that, but he, it's obviously something he can't do for himself. That everything he has to, everything he does has to be in service to someone else. Right, right. And we learn quickly in this book. I, I, yeah, it's this book that mm-hmm. only rich wizarding families have house elves. You know, and yeah. then we learn. Ron says he wishes he has one, but. Because that would be great to do the chores, but they only have a one. So this brings other wishes they had one. Yeah. So this this brings us back to the whole class issue, and really it makes sense tying it in what you're saying, Reels, that you know this is a representation of slavery. But 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 here's my problem. Here's my problem. Here's one of my even more added problem with that situation. That. You've literally created slavery that didn't need to exist. It's just mainly cruel because you can do magic. And literally, we have seen magical spells and books that are there that are able to do this work. That The fact that you are making a, another a being, another creature as you have it, do the work that you can literally wave a wand and think is another level of madness. Well, but, but I mean, it's an accurate representation of society. Exactly, exactly. But, Reels, you just, you just, um, you just supported the very thing that you're talking about. It is a level of madness, but but that is kind of the the, the human beings and their a tendency to want to set up a hierarchy yep. regardless of whether they need it or not. Yep. This, is, this is it's 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 really more about the fact that oh we need someone below us. We need we need this mm-hmm. to oppress someone as opposed to Oh, we need someone to do this for us because we can't do it ourselves. Right. Really well, does you really have supported that very argument, and that that would happen even in a world where people didn't need to oppress 
be other be. Uh, exactly. I'm just like yeah. because every time I meet, because there there are many um, magical creatures that you meet, and that are all right. integral to the plot, right? They're not like minor characters. But even right. when they're not, if you look at how vampires are represented, even how dwarfs are represented, and again, mm-hmm. there are this is these are deliberate acts, right? Because the 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 Marvel have been Elves, if you look at um, Tolkien, another one of those like who wrote like you know sagas of multiple novels, elves are just as equal as dwarves, right? They are just functioning in the world, smart, you know, like being and whatever the case may be. And that that to me was just like I'm not. I get what is happening here. I can understand that you okay one in a house elf, and I'm just like. Why reduce? Because these people all have physical characteristics, right? They all become a thing, and it is the thing that is like quietly not said. Because Hermione is being treated as hysterical when she takes on the plight of the whole thing, <laughs> oh, right? Like, right. like, right. oh my god, like, girl, like, stop, stop already. it, stop it, right? <laughs> okay? so we just, need these elves, cut it out, these elves. and I'm just like, you don't need these elves, and we find out that, you know, that Dumbledore is a benevolent master of this little plantation at Hawk. What? Because he literally pays them, right? But of course, because here's the thing that is upsetting to me. It isn't the fact that Dobby exists. It's the fact that Dobby doesn't... The house elves don't want freedom. Oh, we don't want... Oh, God, money. Thank you. What's wrong with you? Oh, my God, don't say thank you. Like, oh, God. Like, mm-hmm. Oh, my right. God, no. And it's just like... I mean, even the very end of this book, I mean, when... Malfoy kicks Dobby. I was like, no. Beep, I would have said that. I'm just like, what is wrong with you, sir? Like, like you you literally have a piece of stick. The, the moment you're going to pick up the stick now, what you're going to use the stick to do is to hurt a child. Instead yeah. of taking this stick to fix your shoes. And I was, you know, I was when I read that book, I was just like, I, was, I said, MF, please. Raise your wand at Dumbledore. I want to see that. I would take my popcorn. Raise your wand at Dumbledore. <laughs> all the mouth you have in this place, all the money and board governor mess and madness you have, right. pull that one on Dumbledore. Oh, well, Dumbledore, deal with his ass in the fifth book. But not like, you know, I wanted to see. <laughs> right, right. But that's just like, up. I mean, like, this, because to me, it's like, I mean, because this is the problem that I have. It's that, and one of the questions of it is like, in even in the magical world where you have literally magical solution, even in a world like Superman and comic book, where Superman can put beams out of his eye, that you would still have a, a, an issue of like the man is always on top over the woman, and I'm just like, why though? We live in a magical world, right? Like him being right. physically strong doesn't even matter because everyone oh. can be this. All of these magical worlds are reflections of 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 where we are anyway. I mean, nobody is really um, using that as a way to reimagine something, to to reimagine the world. Really, they're God they're damn, putting. Trying to see. Yeah, you know that that that's been the contribution of people of color to to re to imagine a world that would remove some of those hierarchies and to um, to get people to think about ways of coexisting that you you know you just really got people who are acting out of what they've read from their own past and the hierarchies and the structures that they know and the most you're going to get is someone raising a question about it the most you're going to get is a writer saying let's look at this is this right? But they're still going to go back to the things, presenting it in the way that they know. I mean, like even in fantasy, we're still over it. Yeah. I yeah. mean, like that is that is crazy. And yeah. you know, I just want to because I just want to. And and what is even is that Dobby gets his freedom not by overcoming the situation and fighting for his freedom. It's no. accidental. It's yep. a mere, and it's just like what, <clears throat> like for yeah. all of the things that this kid, this I don't even know how old Darby is. Darby is, 
And and again, you know what's even more frustrating? They're treated like children. Mm-hmm. Right. They're treated like children. And right. even just the way in which Dobby expresses attempt to help Harry is just immediately he leaves one mastership to become subservient to another human being. You know right. what I mean? He never even, th- even if he's not doing the things that Harry wants him to do. Right. But he he's still um doing it, you know, putting himself out there to to save Harry. Mm-hmm. Um but so oh, then we see, in addition to Dobby and, and that kind of subservience, you know, we see the whole issue. This is the book where we're dealing with mudblood. We first get that oh, particular. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we get, we get a little bit of pure blood, you know, the whole this about pure blood wizards and, and, and people who are coming from muggle families or are coming from half yeah. and half. But in this book, we get the actual terminology. We get the um, the, the really plays out in in a really strong way between Malfoy um, Malfoy calling Hermione a, a mudblood, mm-hmm. and then having to have that all of that explained, and um, you know, kind of playing on that, and the whole idea that. Um, that the Chamber of Secrets or whoever the monster is in the Chamber of Secrets will wipe out all of the the mud bloods or the not or the pure blood or the right. not pure blood. But you, right. you, you see, I have I'm just gonna say this because these things upset me because again, like I was saying before, you know, like fantasies are like authors, mainly white authors pick up these tropes and don't know how to handle these things effectively. And in essence, what you end up having having is a replication of the real world and in almost, in many cases, giving it almost a pass. Because the mudblood situation, every time I say mudblood, I feel like someone just said to me, nigger. I'm just like... Yeah, I mean, I think... Well, I think that's what it's meant to be. I think that's what it's meant to be. No, I don't mean it in that sense. I feel like if... Well, yes, I guess it's that, that derogatory. But 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 you know what is problematic for me is that how it's not dealt with on an appropriate level. Well, nothing is in this book, and at least that's consistent. I because, mean, nothing, none of none of the inappropriate things that happen in the entire series are ever truly dealt with. We don't deal with the bullying. We don't deal with the class issues. We don't deal with the purity issues from an adult's point of view. That that stuff never gets addressed. Like Hogwarts doesn't have any anti-bullying club. It don't have any like <laughs> no, no. we don't because no. and it's funny because it's very clear that we would later see that the mudblood issue <clears throat> becomes a thing that it's been present. It's been present from the founding of the school, <laughs> and it is yeah. present. Oh, well, it we learned present, it in this book. Exactly. And it yeah, is exactly. present among the students themselves. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I really wish when these books are anything is trying to handle these things is how they don't ever openly say what they're talking about is really ridiculous. Not just the engagement it with it at both sides of the issue, right? We are let we we kind of let these ideas fester. So um, Malfoy calls Hermione for the first time a mudblood, and we let that like, oh my God, this is outrageous. You shouldn't say that. But everyone just like, oh, some people, some wizards have that view. But my yeah. thing is just like, how about we we at schools and education, we really address these things. The Ministry of Math, because we know and and we can see this in our real life, right? That in order for these things to change and effectively some kind of policy may happen is that you need some the governmental structure to put these policies in place and into law. This is precisely why we find out Voldemort was trying to take over the Ministry of Magic and take it over. Because right. he knew in order for this policy to be enacted and actually go, he needed law to do this. But right. it seems as if we act as if these things are harmless ideas. And then what we see is the natural, these things are not harmless ideas because we see the natural conclusion of these things. The final solution. Let's kill them and get rid of them. I don't know that it's approached in a way that these are harmless ideas because it is the underlying reason for the 
problem and that is addressed it's just not addressed the way that we would think it would be by a group of adults i mean because ultimately the issue with Voldemort is that he wants a pure wizarding community so we know that this is an mm-hmm. issue and it's you know and it's interesting because it's this book I think it's this book that we find out that he himself is not a pure blood. Um, but, but this is what he wants. So it's always there and people are fighting against that, but they're not saying that's what they're fighting for. That's it's not I'm clear. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely not clearly. That, laid that, out. that is not how the battle lines are being drawn. We no. let in quiet company and in quiet spaces, these ideas are festering. Right. People are just like, okay, yeah. whatever the case may be. Because, Malfoy is never punished for that statement. Never. Nick is never punished for the statement he says it. People, no. because we take these things as personal insults and personal issues, right? Yeah, and, right. They're definitely and, not looked at as social issues. And what is it's very... Not, it's, it's not looked at as institutional. It's right. looked at as, you know, you know, it's almost like A Malfoy person. had bad manners. Right. So, and um, I, this is the reason this is the reason why people died and this is the reason why people have been fighting you know to keep um Voldemort from coming back as opposed so they're treating it like it's just bad manners but right and that's and that's not even explicitly the fight against Voldemort it's explicitly stated along those terms because even if that were the case in the first wizarding wall when we get to the fifth book, we see that these ideas are still held in high regard. Mm-hmm. Yes. About yes. That, that even people who are in charge of the system. And it's something I don't know. Well, we know Dumbledore has certain issues in overtly taking over power, right? He doesn't right. want to be aggressive. He doesn't want to be a politician. But this is always that's bothering me, is that we let these <clears> things, <throat> they might be like, oh, well, she don't like black people. She don't like this kind of person in this case they don't like wizarding blood they don't like and, and it's just like how let's have a conversation right because right. I, need, I need these magical people to tell me how they are having more magical people because Voldemort first of all you ain't had no children you had none so you're talking right. about well, and that, have. secondly you know, like every one of these people because um, so did you all know oh here's a fun fact that you might not know that every year in Hogwarts, they take 40 students, 10 people from every class, from every house. So there are five Ravenclaw boys and there's five Ravenclaw girls. That's pretty much how this school is. I don't know how as well, but that seems to be the number, right? And that the first year dormitories and they move, it's five boys. It's all, it's five. It's very weird and crazy, but I don't know why. It's never like an unusual um, because when they have class with other students, like other houses, it's 20 of them in a the class. Um, because they, they only have a house, they only share a class with one other house. What, what right? are you saying? That it's usually 20 people. It's each, every year, each house gets 10 students, basically. Oh, you mean 10 new ones? 10 new yeah. ones. Yeah. I see. Five okay. new boys and five new girls. Okay. So the, the selection of the house is not often random well actually i guess so it's it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not random at all it's where is this information that. coming from because the first year dormitory is just five boys of harry harry seamus ron dean and neville and i think in this book they had class with the hufflepuff and it was 20 students in the class so this is the this is a conclusion that you've drawn well, that's how it is. If you if you count the number of people in the class. Well, because I never assumed that. So you're like, these are the people that were in the dormitory with Harry and Ron, right? I never ever assumed that there weren't more first years somewhere else in another room. There weren't. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Why? Um, because, like I said, in this book, they had class with Hufflepuff. Right? I know that they always have classes and they share it with another house. And there were 20 students in the classroom. So there are five there are five boys for Gryffindor, five girls for Gryffindor, and five boys for Ravenclaw, for, um, Hufflepuff. And Can five you provide boys. this me in writing in the book okay. with a page reference? Okay, we will look at that. <laughs> I am almost, this is how it is. Deb, what but, do you think about this? 
Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work it, it out in my brain and trying to remember if I can find anything that that would say that's different. But, you know, that's they they focus. On just, I just figured that they were just focused on those group of kids. Too. And I didn't were, I must admit, I thought like Janina, that there were other kids, other first years somewhere else. Yeah, I know. But but now that I think about them coming on the boats across to Hogwarts. I mean, that was about right. I mean, I guess that was about um, 40 kids. 40 kids. Mm-hmm. It's, it's usually, it's, it's the way it is. Um, He's like, but, that's the way it is. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I think it might be just a neat number she has. I initially, I thought that was the case. But I'm like, they keep saying, Hermione went to the first year dormitory. And Ryan said, you can't come in here. Right? Not the rooms or whatever the case may be. And because I think there was something that happened where the second year was somewhere close by, or whatever. It, it's yeah because they move dormitories every year. They don't exist in the same space. Okay. Because I think they kind of move up, whatever the case. But anyway, that's a random fact. All but right. um, <laughs> we would, can, before we can we talk? One of the things that we had talked about was um my feeling that a lot of times this book was overlooked. Yes. Um, and that some of the reason had to do with with um, characters like Dobby and with characters like and Lockhart that people felt that they were played for humor, and so that because they between their humor and the adventure story, um, a lot of the other kinds of themes were seen as taking a back seat. But in actuality, this book has all of those themes. Some of the things that we've just been talking about in terms of class. In terms of um, you know subjugation of magical creatures and things like that, but there's so much that goes on in this book in terms of symbol symbolism and foreshadowing that um, there's a lot more going on than just the basic plot. There's so much going on in this book. There's so much. I mean, I made a list, and I'm not going to go over the entire list, but. The list is long. The <laughs> list is so long, and I. But it, you, it's just so nicely done. I mean, you, like, okay. But for example, things that are just mentioned briefly, you may hear of them again in the book. But again, it's just briefly. But have such a huge significance later. It's all here. It is all here. We see the um, the vanishing cabinet in, um, right. when Harry goes to uh, the wrong when he gets out at the wrong exit for the flu powder. His flu powder he gets to Nocturne Alley. When he goes to Nocturne Alley, we learn about that cabinet. We learn about the necklace is mentioned. We learn that, about Borgen and Burke. But. We learn about Borgen and Burks. We learn that. Um, uh, we learn about Mundungus Fletcher in this book. And it's just, he's mentioned so briefly, so briefly. Right. But later, he's such a big part of it. This cabinet that just seems to be, oh, that was a beautiful piece of, you know, furniture. is something that's helping people escape in and out of the castle. I mean, it's, this book is so rich with foreshadowing you it's impossible to know that not to mention the fact that horcrux is that we the, the, our first horcrux no the, no the first and the last horcrux it's it's mentioned there what what is it what's mentioned that harry there? is the last horcrux is it's it mentioned all, in this? it's all in this and i'll tell you for two reasons i didn't know we wanted to do with it one, that Harry is a possum or that he can speak possum oh. and doesn't know oh, he's yeah, a possum yeah. That's right, one. Right. And two, right. Dumbledore tells him this. He said, you can do this because Voldemort put a piece of himself in you. And he right. says, oh, yeah. it is your choices yeah. that you make. But we don't know that's how Horcruxes are made yet when he says that, right. correct? But that should have been something be like, what? But you're right. Oh, no, that's another we, piece. That's another piece that we just kind of let slide by. I we mean, thought it was cool. We said, oh, my God, he can speak possible. Oh, it's I just from... Yeah. We were, yeah. Oh, that's what 
scar means. Okay. That's what the scar you. means. And that's exactly how I took it. That's exactly how I took it. And I mean, there's just, there's so much. And I really think that that might be part of why this book gets overlooked because there's so much information that seems to not mean anything in all of it seriously means something. I mean, every single bit of it comes I'm, back. I need to go back because, you know, I have to say that as I was reading this, I, not that, it wasn't a matter of dislike, but I always felt that Dumbledore was lying to Harry and not telling him the whole truth. And he said this explicitly because I think in the first book, book, he mentioned that the scar was the symbol of the mother's love and the protection. And then he says the scar is something else. And I was like, Dumbledore, what, what are we doing here, Albus? Like, we, well, we're shifting he, on the... We, we, he, we seem he to said, be... He, he said the mother's love leaves a protection. protection and when right. Harry reaches for the scar, he said, not the scar. Not the scar is the protection. He said that... Because the scar isn't the isn't the mother's protection. The okay. scar is the, is, the hor- is the symbol of the Horcrux. Yeah. If right. this, this book also tells us that... Um, that Dumbledore and Snape both are um, great. What is the word? They can both do occlumency. Yes. So we get we get that little nugget dropped on us. I mean, there's so much. There's there is a, so I, much. there is a difference between legilimens and occlumency, and I have to I keep trying to be like, oh, that's something I need to figure out. What is the difference? So I yes, Snape and Dumbledore are good. Le, what is the word? Legitimens. So the person that can read the mind is a legitimate. Is a legitimate. The, is it's a person the that's blocking it. Yes. Blocking okay. So right. So that's, you know, we, we learn that here. We also, um, we see, uh, and just so you all know, Dumbledore, um, tortured creature, just so you know that. (laughs) (laughs) I hope you know that. (laughs) Well, so another thing, you know, we, we get information on the powers of the Phoenix and we meet Fox in a, in a more, um, we, we've seen him, but he's, yeah, he's much more detailed here. And we think that he's kind of served his purpose because we learn about the power of him. We learn, you know, Dumbledore says, oh, they can carry heavy loads. They have healing tears. They are the most loyal of all pets. And then at the end of the book, you know, here comes this phoenix and it, it saves Harry's life. And you think, that's it. Okay, you've served your purpose. But he's he's not done. You know, there's like nothing in this book. I don't think there is one single thing in this book that, that we don't see again. That we don't see it's again. Different. There's nothing like that's Aragog. done. Even Aragog. Even Aragog. And Gilderoy Lockhart. Except what and, the one thing yeah. we couldn't we couldn't remember. So this is the book, remember, where Harry, the Weasley brothers come and they get Harry in the car. And then later right. the car saves Harry and Ron from Aragon and the family of spiders from getting eating. I don't know that we ever see the car again. Do we? No. We were trying to remember. That might be the only thing in this book that only is in this book and nothing else. I will give her credit to say the car, the car cleared the path. <laughs> and maybe yeah. that's why the, the Harry takes. But um, I know Deb talked about favorite magical artifacts, uh, artif- but for me, one of the things that I've always enjoyed is when the phoenix comes into being, because I want a phoenix. Let me just say it. I want a <laughs> so, phoenix. Let me I... just say, Fox is badass. Okay? Badass. Yeah. Can I get me one? Badass. Look, I'm not, sure, I'm not trying to get one for you, everybody here. I'm just saying there might be one available, and I want one. And it was and, things and, like and, this that made me very curious about Dumbledore. And yeah. I was like, like, sir, where have you been? What have you done? Well, like, the things right. that you are able to do, because in order for Dumbledore to do this, right, be, be able to, when you call upon showing loyalty to him, creates his, that he can never leave the school, basically, right? Yes. Once he's in his protection, because that's not what's being said, but this is the magical element or magic that's happening here, right? That well, as long as he, uh, in this book. 
it is said in the it is this book that Dumbledore actually says that as long as there are here there as long as there are people loyal to me here at Hogwarts, I will never truly be gone. That, right. That but, is stated specifically here. And we kind of again think that when Fox comes to save Harry because Harry is being loyal to Dumbledore, that that's the end of that. But we see that come up time and time and time again. Right. Which, um, but I mean, it's never really explained like magic, right? It just explained like hmm, Dumbledore is just being, you know, Dumbledore. Because Dumbledore is bigger than everything. Oh, the magic. And I just, this is why, this is one of the reasons I dislike Harry. I'm like, Harry, Dumbledore is right there. Which I would have been on your desk. <laughs> I'm sorry. I would have been like, Harry, like, Dumbledore is right there. Get some notes, brother. Like, I need questions answered, like Dumbledore. How do you do it? You see, in the book five, after that situation happened in the Ministry of Magic, listen to me. I don't want no other defense against a dark art teacher. It's Dumbledore. But That's it takes it. us that long to, for the children in the book. I think so. The kids, the kids in the book, and the students of Hogwarts, they all know that there's this mystique around Dumbledore, but they can't express that. They can't put that into words. I don't believe that they really know that they should go and try to befriend Dumbledore, if that's the way to put it, or to seek information from him. I don't think they know that. I don't. I. I don't think they know that at all. I mean, I, I think, don't disagree with you, but again, this is a 12-year-old. He's in yeah. awe. He's not thinking, I need to learn from you and let me let me get a piece of that knowledge. That's not how a child thinks. They're just like, wow. Dumbledore is, Dumbledore is magical and Dumbledore to adults. It's yeah. adults who are like, yeah. Uh, because Dobby says it. He says, oh, there is magic that Abba Dumbledore will not do. And it's something that um, Professor McGonagall does, said as well. She's just like, but Albus, you can do that. And he's just like, oh, you know, she said, you're too noble. And um, I thought he said something along that line to Harry that there. So he's just like, it's safe at Hogwarts. And I'm just like, no, it's not safe at Hogwarts, okay? No, I don't know where you people keep getting this impression. Actually, because... actually I think that that's a, a, a we're not, now that I've read the series multiple times, I almost think that's an ironic statement <laughs> when people say it's very it's ironic like in the world in the, yeah. in the world is at Hogwarts because of all of the stuff that goes on at Hogwarts uh, and all of the stuff that Dumbledore allows to go on. At, at Hogwarts and lets the, the students figure out for themselves. So I think it's almost a, a little bit of irony that, you know, that statement. The other thing that um, that we get a lot of we get a lot of foreshadowing about is the whole is the connection between we, we hit upon it, the connection between Harry and Voldemort and the parcel tongue. Yeah. Um, the fact that he is able and, and of course, that is immediately everybody else has been cheering Harry for a year oh, look at the heroic Harry Potter is here in our school, except for the Slytherins, of course. And yeah. then when he speaks Parseltongue, he becomes an outcast. And even his friends, are, they're, not, they're not casting him out. They're worried about the fact that he can do it. And so um, because the only other wizard anybody's ever known to do it right. is, is it's always been a dark wizard. No, it's, it's never Voldemort. Been, it's actually that Dumbledore yeah. stresses that, that the only powerful mouth that has been is Silazar Slytherin Sil- Sil- himself, Voldemort, right. and now you. Yeah. Right. And I'm like. And Harry's worried because remember, he was worried that the sorting hat was going to put him in Slytherin. And so he's. this is the first when he started to get the doubts that we see played out in book five. You know, is there something wrong with me? Yeah. Is there something? Something wrong with me. Right up until now, we were celebrating. Oh, everything is beautiful. I'm magical. This is wonderful. And now we're starting to get this and starting to get these hints of, oh, wait a minute. What's what's going on with me? Am, am I, you know, do I have aspects of a dark wizard and that kind of thing? Well, so also really that the people does. that people that but also that the children know that people couldn't because. Harry is something of an anomaly, right? On any right. other circumstance, right? Even if Voldemort didn't try to kill him, is that the fact that he survived the Avada Kedavra curse, right? right. No one right. has ever survived this one. He, He's the it. boy who lived. And yeah. then you're beginning to wonder how it is that this boy can do this. Like, maybe he's not that silly little boy that we, you know, like, exactly. kid that, you know, 
the speckled kid. Maybe so there's something to him. It's interesting when so when they're doing the dueling club, which we yeah let's we could talk about that now because we're here. But this is when the school and everybody realizes that Harry, including Harry, realizes that he's a right. he's a parcel mouth because even though he knows that he's talked to snakes in the past, he never knew that it wasn't happening in his native tongue. He just right. assumed, you know, okay, this is a little weird, but whatever, you know, but now yeah. having someone witness that, now he knows that it, it's a different language and it sounds different and that freaks everybody out. Um, but that dueling scene, so that gives us, so that gives us some humor that we get in this book, but it also gives us some more foreshadowing. So let's do the humor first. Um, I was kind of like, I'm not going to lie, I'm cracking up because... I'm listening to this and to this audio book and they're dueling and they're fighting and Draco and Harry are going at it. And, you know, Hermione, Hermione, what's her name? Uh, I'm Bill, I'm Millicent. Bill Millicent <laughs> are going at it and everything's going haywire. And then Miss Millicent, she's like, you know what? Screw the wands. We don't need magic. I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> 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 where like Harry looks over and Hermione's in a headlock and I'm like what is this but you know at the same time I guess like oh, kids get mad they're gonna fight I loved that I, I don't know why I got so much pleasure out of that because I guess it just you know I, I talked about before part of my attraction to all of this is that there are there are lots of pieces of it that aren't so far-fetched that it couldn't possibly be real so that's a piece. Like, I like to know that kids are at school just fighting. <laughs> but the fact that it was Hermione, like, getting her butt whooped by some girl because the dueling's not going well. And we don't really, no. I don't think we really I, know. I, I think the girl, I think Hermione did something to the girl. I think and the probably girl said something like, to her. And we don't know that, though. Like, yeah, we don't know it, I but mean, I would I, assume I, that I, Hermione I, was just better, and the girl was like, screw this, I can't beat you with magic, I'm going to beat you up. Let me punch this heifer in her face. Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> because, actually, you know, it's a it's a thing that J.K. Rowling does, I, I, not to forget your point, because it happens with Millicent's hair, is that right. how J.K. Rowling describes people she doesn't really want us to like, is because the thing that's in, that intrigued me about this scene was how Harry described Millicent. He was just like, she reminded me of a picture that I saw with Holiday at the, with Hags. And I was just like, right. this is another 12 year old you're talking about, girl. Wait, what are you talking about? The insult. And that when Millicent, when Millicent had her mind in a headlock, right? Like, she, she was about to snap that chicken neck, right? That. Harry had trouble pulling Millicent, <laughs> which means Millicent was bigger than Harry. So Millicent right. is like some sort of a, um, I don't know, like a She-Hulk kind of a um, What did figure. you call her? What? what? A She-Hulk. Okay. But, <laughs> but the other, you know, we, we also, we talked, we talked about the dueling. The other thing that we see is Hermione being able to, um, to, to do that whole polyjuice potion. Oh. And that's a foreshadowing of later when the polyjuice potion be, again plays a major role um, in, the, in the plots of the, yeah. of the later book. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, we always, been, we've been told how bright she is, how smart she is, but here she's doing a level of magic and potions magic mm. that is so far ahead of everyone else. And she, and also the way that she has figured out um, who the, the the whole story behind the chamber. And this is, um, this is what I'm saying, Hermione don't get her credit. She don't get the credit she deserves. She don't get the credit. But there is something that we sort of missed here. I don't know if Gina was going to hint at that. But there's two things with the dueling scene. One, we're introduced to the Expelliarmus um, charm. Yes. We're yes. introduced to that. God knows you see that 11 more billion times. Yes, yes. <laughs> and also, we're introduced to three things. Two, we're introduced to where the snake appears and the mm -hmm. snake is disappearing a puff of smoke. And mm -hmm. that will right. come up again in another duel. But here is my contention that it is never in classrooms that the children actually learn defense against the magic. 
Of course any not. Kind of well, it is with Lupin. No. Just no. we haven't seen it yet. Wow. Well, you know, really, I mean, this this year, this this particular year in Defense Against the Dark Arts is a lost cause. I mean, oh. Gilderoy, <laughs> Gilderoy Dark Art. This is a lost cause. You oh, know, Gilderoy. To me. There you know, is Harry, a whole... Harry, 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 he cannot, you know, he is not going to be... <laughs> Deb, do that again. Come on, do it again. Deb, Harry, 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 <laughs> he is not going to be any help to anybody learning anything. Zero. So, and you know what I got mad about? You know what pisses me off about Gilderoy? Like, is that Dumbledore knew this motherfucker was a fake. Forgive me for talking. No, for, for, listen, Dumbledore no. knew he was a fake. Dumbledore knew. <laughs> but you see, also Dumbledore, he, every year, remember, Dumbledore would get like to the last day and could hadn't found anybody to teach that class. He's this like, I got to get somebody in here. To me. And I got to get point. a warm body. And I got to get a warm body to teach this class. And I figure, you know, I go in here, just prop him down in there. Because, you know, you didn't get any indication when he was signing those books that he was going to be, you know, well, they did have a lot of his books on the list, but you didn't get a sense that this had been so A lot. It was all of them. But I actually, (laughs) funny enough, I actually did. I thought Ron was giving me the most information about him and just to which class was happening because it was the children who were doing the reading. Hermione stopped this this thing. She was the one. Right. Because I was just like, and he was kept talking, and I'm just like, dude, like, is he supposed to be like over the top flamboyant gay character? But I'm just like, at the end of the day, why are you in here? Like, get out of here. Like, oh, I never you're... thought he was gay. I just assumed that he was, um, like a Hollywood prototype romance novel, care. like, like Fabio, the oh, the guy really? on the the romance novel covers. I, you know, I, I assumed that he was kind of a celebrity. Yeah. Um, and people like people who celebrities who write books for kids mm-hmm. and they um, assume that, you know, they know stuff because they're a celebrity. I didn't, I just assumed that oh. he was, you know, just kind of this vanity yeah. this person. And, you know, you think about it, he's one of these people who has talked himself in, into big positions. He's never oh, really man. done anything. Only thing he's ever accomplished is the confundus charm so he can steal people's um, right. what people have actually done but, and leave the people... And we know over, over and over we hear how good looking he is and this is just, you know, that whole... What? Let's, yeah. let's fly through on your good looks like but that. Wait, no. who are good looking, wait. are successful. But but there are so many clues. First of all, Ron don't like him, and how Ron was like, he's something, but Ron doesn't say what it is. Ron doesn't he, like him because he, Hermione is smitten with him. I know, but Ron, Ron, doesn't, Ron doesn't know how to deal with that feeling yet. That is not a thing yet because at this point, Hermione is still annoying, right? Hermione is more. No, I think. Point. Really? You think? Yeah. I think, I think when Hermione shows this attention to Gilderoy and sleeping with the autograph and all of that stuff, I think that the emotion that Ron is showing is jealousy. I don't know if it's because, I mean, at this point, Hermione is one of the home girl. I think when Hermione changes is when Hermione fixes her front teeth. When those things got reduced, because she had like two, as we would say back in the day, buck rabbit teeth, right? That she was supposed to fix with braces. So but she that's never when Ron them. notices her more, not right. so much that she notices herself. No, 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 no. That's my point. That it, it's from it's in book three in my mind that Ron starts to be like, oh, Hermione is a girl. Like she's a girl that I might be interested in. in yeah. Book four, it becomes problematic. But um, in this book with Gilderoy, whenever Harry goes to his office, there are pictures with curlers in their hair, um, the way in which Snape looks at him, and also in this very oh, scene in the are. duel. Sorry, I hit the wrong okay. <laughs> with the um with the scene with the dueling happening when Harry um when Gilderoy is trying to wave his wand to show he the wand he does a whole bunch of like flourishes. He drops and he says, whoopsie. He and does. Like, and and you know what? Like, I just really just thought it was an <laughs> all a big act. I never, yeah, I never thought, I never thought gay. I never thought that about him. I just thought this is one big 
act and he's just over the top dramatic yeah. but not in a flamboyant gay man way i never i never thought that but, but you know what you're the gay man here if you say he's gay i'm you gonna know, go with it <laughs> I, I don't want to i don't want to describe like you know because like in the stereotype but i just think you know this that she gives these sort of uh, um characterization and hints at people and he's like he's ineffectual like he doesn't do anything right. Like, mm-hmm. he, he can't even do a simple spell, like, he besides do that. Thing. Thing. He doesn't mm-hmm. even know how to even hold on to his own wand. Like, you know, like, yeah. I mean, there, there are certain skills. And this is the thing that I have with magical education. Because the skills only are able to, like, apparently, before you're 11, you don't do anything, right? You stay at home <laughs> with your parents. And whatever the case may be, if you're probably like a mind, you went to regular school. Um, then there's no clue as to how she manifests it. It's because everyone seems to have been aware that they were magical beforehand. Mm-hmm. It doesn't explain how this happened for um thing, <clears throat> but we saw this with I think we see Lily that they just thought this was just like neat tricks, right? And then right. it wasn't until Snape would say, "Oh, this is what you are." That is like, oh, okay, yeah. But um, Gilderoy just like and Gilderoy just seemed like a hot mess. Well, he like, is a hot mess, and he's also a hot mess no and dangerous hot mess too. A dangerous because, hot mess, which but is the worst very- combination. But a very um, cunning and ability to look out for himself and to, you know, because if 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 he had if he had had an actual wand and not, <laughs> not Ron's, you know, b- b- put piece together thing, he yeah. would have really done some serious damage. Oh, he was looking to kill them. He was looking to kill them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But, and, and it was all about his own self preservation. So even though he was played for laughs for most of the book when when the rubber met the road he was a dangerous person he was very and, dangerous and he was going to he was going to do whatever he needed to do to preserve that image of who he was he had his story all straight in terms of what he was going to tell folks when he yes, got he back did. Out of yes, he but did. This, not, this, was this was not a buffoon this is somebody very cunning um, who knew how to take care of himself. And uh, th- when he, when they realize what he's done, um, or when they realize that he's afraid and he's going to run away and they question him right. on that, they're like, but you're our defense against the dark arts. That, that pissed you have me to off help so much. Us. So, that pissed me off so but much. But that's when he like, says, like, did you really think? And then again, the insults. The insults when he's talking about everybody are hardcore. He talks about some witch having a hair lip and she couldn't yeah. have a cover of books. And I mean, this, listen, if JK Rowling can't do anything else, she can throw some insults. I mean, she can do a throw lot. Shade, she you know. she is shade. really, She's really She's all about the conventional. She's all about she is, the conventional. Ooh, she said, conventional. we're not, we are not sugarcoating anything, boo. You're fat, you're ugly, and you're stupid. <laughs> like, that's what, you know, she just throws it all out there. Do you see, like, in the beginning of the book, and you see this early on, right? Uncle Vernon is a fat walrus. <laughs> Petuna is a bony, horse-faced woman. And Dudley mm-hmm. is a um is a pig, a porky yeah. pig. Yeah, I was right. like, ooh, she nearly made me turn me off from bacon. But, girl, <laughs> hey, I was, uh, even as, as big as Hagrid is, he put a tail on him. Right. 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 He put a tail on him. So listen, I think this is probably a good place to stop. And then when we pick up next time, we can talk about, we can let people know that we're going to talk about how Hermione starts to change. I want us to talk about Gilderoy Lockhart a little bit more. And there's like some more deep symbolism in here that we the need to talk about. The actual Chamber of Secrets, right? We can talk about the actual <laughs> Chamber of Secrets. But we're going to... And we're going to um, talk about and, and the diary. Yeah. We're going to talk about the diary. We're going to talk about how we learn more about the connection of Harry and Voldemort. And we're going to talk about, and I would love to hear from people, what does the red hair represent for the Weasley family? So we're definitely going to get into that. But this is probably a good place to stop. Oh, Because uh, that's going to be a long conversation, the yeah, next one. Yeah. Oh, I would just want to point out that when Debbie talked about how dangerous Lockhart was, we were talking about him trying to kill them in the Chamber of Secrets. But this idiot removed all the bone out of Harry hand, and I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't right. be a teacher. You shouldn't be a teacher. Like, you just shouldn't have a job. And he just yeah. goes, 
Oh, oh, haven't done that for a while. Better go see okay. Betty Humphrey. <laughs> I, can I say that? Can I say <laughs> <my> man moment. <laughs> And can I say, I don't know how refereeing and officiating goes on at this school, but this is twice now in a Quidditch game, right? Where mm-hmm. Harry is almost killed, and the game goes on like nothing's happening. He's it's almost fine. thrown off a broom. It's and we're like, okay, literally there's a blood just trying to murder him. And we're like, play on, play on. And I'm like... They call a timeout, and it's just like, what? But there's a dangerous yeah. notion that happens here where yeah. I think we see this now, you know, in real life in terms of where people are trying to push on in an event that is dangerous just so that right. you can get a win. It's yeah. like, Harry, there is something yeah. that's trying to kill you. And in fact, and I don't even know how, how George and Fred are able to control that. Seeing that Harry is going at a way faster rate, rate of speed than they are, and they're still brooms. And I'm just like, what is happening here? Like, why? Where are the professors? Where, where's Madame Hooch? What the hell, girl? Well, do your research. <laughs> so, um, the safest place. I'm telling you, Green Gods might be the only safe place out there. <laughs> yeah, and how safe is that? We'll come to see, right? Um. And just, you know, just to call out Professor Reels, he didn't do the quiz question. He doesn't know it either. If anybody can come up with it before Reels can and you DM me and let me know, I may or may not, I will, totally okay. have a little piece of Harry Potter memorabilia for you. So if you can come <laughs> up with that answer, send it to me well, in a DM. When, I will when send we record you next week? Are we recording next week? Um, Probably. Okay. So I will have the answer then. One of the issues is that, and I still have to come up with a trivia for book two, but I will then. Yeah, that's because you didn't answer the first one. I will. But anyway. <laughs> but Ed, that's okay. That's okay. So what yeah, bridge. let me, this, I, I don't even remember what the question was. It was so incredibly oh, complicated. However, you can. That, the question was that, can you arrange the potion bottles in the okay. order in which they were, that's in Snape's task in the first book? Unbelievable. Yeah, so if you can answer that, and um, I'll, I'll send you a little Harry Potter That's snippet of love. There's so many little nuggets that in these books, though I don't always like a lot of them, and they have a lot of issues around these books, um, there's always some little nugget in the book that is always like, oh my god, this is so amazing, like I wish I could have think of this. Like this book being like the many symbolism she has in this book, that that requires the mind that is so 3D. Her transparent. mind is so brilliant. Yeah, like all her organizational skills, which I know I need. Looking at my table right now that I've been toning on all my <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I need some of that organization. Oh, yeah, Lord. Well, that's really yeah, I give her that credit. You. Okay. So, Thank you, folks, for listening in. Janine is going to play some fancy music at the end at the Black Cauldron. Thank you for another episode. This is our third episode. Hope you love it. And just so we're clear, so fun, we're not finished with the second book. So <laughs> it seems the running go, theme. Go so, figure, right? Go figure. Now, listen, people, that it was supposed to be that we were supposed to do one episode for the first to three books, and then from book four, it's going to be two episodes. I suspect it's going to be three episodes. Episode from four to seven. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect. So you have a lot of you have a lot of content from us. So that I mean, because here. what we, else do you have to do? You're quarantined. Even yeah, if your right. state is reopening, stay home. We didn't want to give you a seven as a magical number, right? We didn't want to give you that. We wanted to give you to go. We wanted to go above and beyond, like Voldemort, right? Go beyond the realm of re- regular magical podcasts. So I hope you enjoy another episode of Exciting of, of Black Cauldron. See you next week for a nice hot drink. I'm bringing Lika next time. I swear to God I am. Fire whiskey to the rescue. Something fruity for Gilderoy. Something lavender. (laughs) (laughs) Let's design a cocktail. All right. right, Managed. Yes.